thank you. Uh, okay, so we're going to um, give Hello. you. Got it? That's, no. ah, that's not what it's meant to be showing. Okay. Well, I'll go. I'll continue anyway because we're going to run out of time otherwise, right? Yeah, yeah, go on. Okay. I'll deal with this problem. Okay, so um, this is uh, a paper from the qualitative work that I've done with mixed, uh, uh, that I've done. I've done the qualitative work and it's mixed with the quantitative work from uh, David Peets and Carolyn Troop and the editorial assistance from Ian Lowe and um, Robert Hales. The project was begun as an ARC study that we wanted to look at the different ways that climate scientists, food scientists and astronomers were publicly perceived and responded to. What we found in the course of the quantitative work was that there was a very gendered difference in the way that scientists saw barriers to themselves in ways that were one, personalised, um, for example, and sexual harassment, two, intergenerational, interorganisational um, ways which were manifest as um, uh, uh, the changes in the curricula or criteria for individual work performances and the third way was um, extra organizational intimidation uh, as in trolling climate scientists so we need to move on okay so can you see the slide says research questions yes we can yes. Uh, okay. Okay. okay okay now i know what you're saying okay so so what we were looking at was what are the experiences of women scientists and the sub questions included what barriers do they face are they subject to harassment intimidation or microaggressions or and lastly does class have a role does lack of class mean lack of networks okay so the background to this was that um, harassment can be but is not only a problem identified by some women scientists Intimidation in science, uh, as we've really heard from that, man, many, um, can take the form of individual, personalised or functional uh, into organisational or extra organisational intimidation. Our larger project has collected data on all forms, but this part of the study is focused on individual intimidation, which is heavily gendered and sometimes the result of sexual harassment. This is also the focus of the existing literature on harassment. So, we differentiate. Existing literature covers power, patriarchy, race, and ethnicity based on what you're all familiar with, the theories of intersection, intersectionality. What we think is a bit unique is we have documented or discussed the role of class in harassment. That is, whether these male-dominated institutions have individuals who exert their power arising from this superior class position and behave in ways that exclude, underfund, bully, or are sexually inappropriate to those females they consider their, their social inferior. So the methodology for what we're doing, um, like Lena said, it's part of a, a bigger pro project. There's quantitative and qualitative elements to it. The quantitative aspects, which I'll talk about a bit, are a big survey we did of scientists, an international survey uh, from people all around the world, uh, and they publish in journals in three fields relating to uh, climate science, food science, and astronomy, uh, and they published over that, that um, period from 2015 to 2020. We've got a couple of thousand observations out of there. The qualitative interviews, which I did via Zoom, with 30 female scientists in various fields, included scientists in astronomy, mathematics, botany, and Antarctic studies. Antarctic studies. Um, they were working in research and teaching in universities or in the government. They lived in Australia, the US, South Africa, Canada, and the UK. We chose them either for their prominence as a woman scientist or having written about women in science. The interviews lasted approximately one hour. There were 10 questions that these were transcribed and then analysed. We used pseudonyms but gave women their actual titles as we talked to you about them. So just to give an overview of where people were at from the quantitative data, um, most by 90 odd percent of of people of both sexes said that they were inspired by their jobs and they were I was very engaged with it. 
Well, when you ask people how satisfied you are with careers in the organisation, well, you can see there's, there's quite a significant gender difference there, about nine percentage points. 51% of men versus only 41% of women agreed that they were satisfied with their career opportunities in the organisation, which is usually university. And um, a similar eight percentage point difference between people according to whether they're satisfied with their career opportunities uh, in the sector as a well. whole. Now, we asked people um, whether they'd experienced one of a series of potential incidents um, and we were doing this to basically ascertain what was happening with intimidation and harassment. Now, we can't say that this, these are a fully representative sample. It would probably overstate the overall incidence of harassment, um, but it gives us some idea of the relative importance of various forms. So um, we divided harassment and intimidation into two types, individual and functional. <coughs> individual being basically sexual harassment or sex-based harassment or some sort of personal bullying. Um, and we found that 28% of women and 14% of men recorded uh, something that they described as unwelcome behaviour with the intention or effect of making you feel intimidated or harassed. And 8% of women, but only 1% of men, said they experienced unwelcome or inappropriate behaviour of a sexual nature. So the majority of individualised bullying or harassment that people were getting was not sexual, but it was other forms of behaviour, which I'll get to shortly. The other ones further down the chart, I won't go through each of them individually, Basically, you can see the differences between men and women in the incidence of those things as reported in the study are much less. Sometimes they're, they're non-significant. Um, the, the big differences, the big gender differences are in relation to the individual forms of harassment. All up around about 34% of men and about 48% of women in our study reported um, one or more forms of, of harassment, and that's uh, about a third to a half more than what you'd get in Australia. So the number in Australia, which is higher than this, uh, is, a, is uh, quite a bit higher than what we got from that random study that uh, Glenda and I and others were involved in a few years ago. In relation to that, that uh, first item there that was the unwelcome behaviour with the intention or effect of making you feel intimidated or harassed, we we got them to specify what was it, we gave the, these various options, and you can see in most of them, uh, there's quite a big gender difference there. Persistent criticism, 16% of the women in our sample versus 6% of the men reported persistent criticisms. 14% versus 5 reported verbal abuse. 11% versus 6 reported being subject to gossip. 9% versus 3 reported being excluded from, from work-related networks and slightly more from work-based activities. So throughout this pattern of individualised uh, harassment, you find there's a gendering of it, that it is predominantly amongst women and quite a lot of it re re relates either to criticism or, or aggression of some sort, or what we refer to as microaggression later on, or to exclusion or, or some actions that keep people away from networks. Um, and these things have, a, uh, have an impact on people's... Uh, 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 actually, I'll skip that slide and lead on to Gina, because we're <laughs> running out of time. Okay. So a um, lot of the, um, the women complained about uh, having to operate in positions when, when men were in positions of power in science, particularly those women who were um, in, in, down in Antarctica. But this woman wasn't. She, she was a, uh, an, an Australian woman, but um, she wasn't in Antarctica, but she was an Australian woman. And she said, the stuff that I've tended to notice personally is that it's very difficult being the sole woman in an academic department populated by men, even good men who are nice. And the reason is that too many of them don't reflect on whether their behaviour is excluding women because they just behave in particular ways that I don't think that women behave in. 
We also talked about microaggressions. Um, the same woman, uh, Professor Charlotte, she, she said that um, in her own experience of harassment, she said, I used to go along to a weekend field camp. All of the other staff would be males. I liked a lot of and respected them a, a great deal, but as a group, I found them unbearable. After two or three days, I would just simply feel that I'd been left out. I'm constantly sidelined and listening to them bullshit on and try to outcompete each other with silly jokes and stories and one up each other. And I just thought it was just so fucking childish. I'm fed up with it. Well, they didn't do it deliberately, I guess. Professor Beryl was an English woman who was, um, uh, had got a job in, in, in the US. And she talked about harassment. Um, uh, they, they, she said that they're committing microaggressions. They might think of themselves as progressive and then they say shit, which is, wow, you've completely wiped out that person's confidence in themselves. In some cases, people in the room are smart enough to know that they can ignore it, but not if it's happening all the time. So I would say that a major issue these days um, Professor Aurel, who was also a US um, mathematician, she said, when she's talking about her own experiences, she said he was the user of dispar disparagement humour, where the perpetrator tries to disparage the victim by accusing them after they have been the target of a joke to say that you have no sense of humour. It was only a joke. Uh, Dr. Mary, who was a technologist um, who sent us in uh, a written, um, a written um, response, said uh, using a male, that she'd had to use a male for protection against other males to stop uh, a situation where after she'd been raped and for the purpose of not being fur further harassed. And she said, a year later, I was raped in my office by a different colleague. I was able to organize on exchange an exchange of offices so I didn't have to work in that space anymore, although now two of my staff work in that office. The rapist works on the other side of my building and I have used my veto power when it was suggested he be moved over and become one of my staff. After the raid, I befriended a senior scientist in another group and we put out rumors that we were having an affair. The sexual harassment stopped and that suspicion kept me safe for many years. He eventually became my group leader, then research leader and mentor. He was a brilliant leader and our technology became world leading. Okay, and so I'll just show you that slide that, that I skipped through before. Um, this sort of sexual um, harassment and so on, although the rape that Georgina just described only comes up very rarely, thank God, as a proportion of the total instances, but the, the general pattern of sexual harassment has an impact upon women's per perceptions of their career possibilities. So we asked um, people whether they were satisfied with their career opportunities in the, in the sector. 65% of those who had not experienced sexual harassment versus only 55% of those who had experienced sexual uh, harassment or unwelcome sexual behaviour reported satisfaction. So there's there's a lasting impact that people perceive on their careers that's relating one way or another to the experience of uh, harassment. I now want to turn to issues about class and the way class and networks relate to some of our findings. So just to just to um, give some background, uh, in amongst men, 52% uh, of of uh, men in the sample came from families with a professional managerial background and based that on the type of job their main income earning parents was, was on. Fifty nine percent of women had parents from that background, background, which basically meant that it was harder for women than for men to get into sciences if uh, they were not from a professional background. Um, now. You saw earlier those experience, the, the incidents of people saying they experienced an incident. We see class and gender both uh, shape uh, how often people are likely to experience an incident. Um, working class people amongst working class women, about 52% had experienced an incident. 
that was only the case of 46 percent of women who had a background from uh, middle or professional classes. Uh, amongst men, the difference was small. It was only 36 percent versus 34 percent. So the the intersection of class and gender appeared to influence the susceptibility that people may have to harassment. And these things also shaped their satisfaction with their career opportunities. You saw earlier uh, that women had lower satisfaction with their career opportunities than men. This is now expressing that um, agree-disagree question on a five-point scale and showing their averages there. But also working class, uh, people with working class background had lower satisfaction with their career opportunities. And down the bottom, what you see is that when we ask people, you know, when was one of the things you experienced being excluded from work-related networks? Well, those who said yes, they had a lot lower satisfaction with their sexual career opportunities. So networks appeared to be having quite an influence on the perceptions people were having about their career opportunities. And so to look at it another way, um, amongst those who were not excluded, who did not report being excluded from, from workplace networks, 66% were happy with their career opportunities. But that goes down to only 44% amongst those who reported being excluded from work-related networks. Now, that's actually a bigger effect than the, the one that comes just from uh, reporting the sexual harassment that I, I showed you earlier. So there's there's a big impact on people's perceptions of the career opportunities from forms of, of intimidation or harassment that basically are excluding them from networks at work. Okay, so when I um, talked to um, Professor Beryl about this, the, um, woman in the, U the UK woman in the US, she said that she identified class um, as a, pro as a uh, she identified the nature of class in the US. She said, I don't think in the US there's explicit barriers. I think there is implicit ones, and some instructors do not know they are committing microaggressions. But she said that this is the result of national variation, because in the UK, you're immediately slotted into a class. But in the US, even though she has a working class accent, they can't tell the difference between the different British accents. So her first supervisor, she says, was a dick. And she made little progress until she moved universities, where her next supervisor, he had the same working class background that she had. And we had more in common from that point of view. Dr. Katie was an astronomer, a US astronomer, and she says our country, the US, has set it up so that the poor stay poor and undereducated. If you have the right support network and you have the right opportunities, then you can do anything in this country, but you have to have these things. And the, the, those things are kept away from everybody else. I have noticed that people look at my background, like my educational background, and they're like, well, maybe that's why you, you don't succeed. So, class and class networks, what becomes important through listening to the women's stories was the significance of class. And class is not really explore, explored in the existing literature as a further response for women scientists' discrimination and, 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 and inequity. A woman scientist's class position mattered in a number of ways. In the, educa in the education system at all levels, as a student in her access to a good school, an elite university and within university the confidence she has to be able to negotiate with colleagues relationships and their unrealistic expectations. Class networks matter because families that have class confidence and expectations and money go a long way to ens ensuring individual female success. And also getting to be a scientist in the first place, as we can see. So this was just um, something that um, was brought to my notice a couple of um, days ago, and that it shows the uh, in Australia the um, the uh, alumni from Scots College in Melbourne, and it shows that uh, from this elite co college, uh, secondary college, they have seven um, prime uh, premiers for different um, states in Australia. But they've also got a lot of the major Australian scientists from this uh, elite college, Scotch College, uh, including the um, expert in 
professor of biochemistry, um, mathematicians, lithium carbonated, blah, blah. So there's a lot of um, the, and Peter Singer, who is of course the, one of the most famous um, biologists. So the, what conclusions do we draw from this? Well, first of all, looking from the, the survey data and how it informs the qualitative data, we see how sexual and sex-based harassment are major problems for, for women's scientists. Sex-based harassment, which isn't necessarily sexual, but it's a, it becomes especially a problem when it affects access to networks. Of course, it's through access to networks that a lot of progression appears. So microaggressions that we see, constant criticism, ridicule, gossip, verbal abuse, they are often directed at women, disproportionately directed at women, and these have adverse effects, effects on people, on their psychology, but on their advancement. And class and networks, they can be intertwined factors because how does class manifest itself in enabling people to get progression through the networks that ensure that people who are in positions of power will, will bring beside them people who've come from that same background. So class, the inter, inter, intersection of class and networks affects careers because class operates through networks in its impact on careers. And in particular, it affects access to scientific careers. And this is especially the case for women if women are being then excluded from their works in some way or another then that's going to be particularly adverse for them. So class affects exposure and susceptibility to harassment by making people, by you know, lower class backgrounds, making people slightly more susceptible to harassment, um, but also particularly making them more susceptible to problems with advancement uh, within science. So networks are critical to continued advancement through science and males sometimes withhold access to those networks from females. Thank you. Thank you very much, David and Georgina, um, for that uh, run through. And